We've talked before about the S-shaped curve of technology adoption and how in many countries around the world the pace of electric vehicle purchases just keeps increasing. That means that over the next 10 or 15 years we'll be switching to a world in which the convenience level of owning a gas car is going to plummet, and to a world in which charging points for EVs are likely to become ubiquitous. But as we increasingly transition to electricity as a means of power for transportation, one statement comes up over and over again. The electrical grid will fail. Tacked around that statement are all sorts of assumptions and conspiracy theories, most of which seem to be predicated on the idea that we won't change anything else about the grid between now and the EV event horizon, which seems unlikely. But recently there's been a ton of research that's come out that suggests that EVs may yet save the grid and that a totally clean grid is within reach. So let's find out how that could work. So before we get started, for those who want to play along at home, we've dropped links to a variety of studies and articles down in the description below and on the laser display screen for the studio audience. We're looking particularly at a study examining the US grid, but similar studies exist for many other parts of the world and they often draw pretty similar conclusions. Okie dokie. And for the purposes of the main paper we're digging into here, the definition of clean renewable energy we're, or, or at least the authors are using, is energy that emits no climate or human impacting pollutants when it is consumed and which has a source that constantly replenishes it. That means on and offshore wind power, hydropower, geothermal energy or solar, most commonly through photovoltaic systems. As most folks are well aware, unlike traditional fossil fuel generation systems, renewable sources of energy are often intermittent. The wind doesn't always blow, and as those of us living in the Pacific Northwest will attest, the sun doesn't always shine. In fact, its occasional appearances in the spring often cause confusion as we stare at the mysterious glowing orb in the sky. This has led to some to claim that switching to renewables is impossible, and that it will and has led to blackouts. Perhaps most notoriously, Governor Greg Abbott blamed renewables for the Texas blackouts of winter 2021, a statement later shown to be staggeringly false when the Texas utilities revealed that natural gas plants were the largest source of failure, and in most cases the problems were caused by the utilities' decisions not to winterize equipment causing cascading failures in fossil fuel infrastructure and, in the case of wind turbines, the lack of winterizing meant no de-icing equipment. It didn't mean there wasn't any wind. Similarly, the 2020 blackouts in California were initially attributed to renewables, but later turned out to have a much more complex cause related to energy generation mainly outside the state. So let's take a moment to look at how the authors examined this problem. They used energy consumption data from 2018 along with electrical load data from 13 US regions from 2016 through 2022. The forward projections of energy usage were taken from the US Energy Information Administration and the grid is modelled out to 2050. Those EIA projections were added to with data from techniques that allow them to more accurately calculate rooftop solar availability and do a more detailed analysis of onshore wind resources, and they also accounted for end-use power reductions thanks to the reduced need to extract fossil fuels. Of course that's not the only thing that will shift with changes to energy generation, and the study goes into incredible depth, examining things like land usage, direct and indirect job changes that will accompany a shift from business as usual to wind, water and solar generation and transmission. So how would this theoretical grid work? Well, the ideal solution is one in which grid interconnection between the different states is strengthened, and that includes the notoriously go-it-alone Texas. The state whose go-it-alone attitude stems from a desire to not have those pesky federal requirements like, you know, winterizing equipment. If I'd mentioned earlier, that would probably be a Chekhov's gun, by the way. These interconnections allow for more efficient use of the available energy and a reduced cost of energy overall. That said, the study's authors indicate that each individual region, they divide the grid into eight regions, does have capacity to generate sufficient power to have a 100% clean and stable grid. It's just more expensive and difficult to do it. The projections from the study indicate that wind and solar will dominate future US energy production, with around 45% coming from wind and 51% from solar. 
The study assumes that the roughly 3% it expects to come from hydro is drawn from already existing infrastructure, which is fascinating. I assumed we'd be building more. And I'd also assumed that wave power would make up a greater proportion of energy production, but apparently not in this model. And that perception that I have probably comes from me growing up on an island. Unsurprisingly, during periods where excess energy is generated, that would need to be stored, either in hydro storage facilities or through hydrogen generation, or in battery storage facilities. Those battery storage facilities would be pretty big. The total USA requirement is around 16 terawatt hours of battery storage. That's for a well-connected grid. It nearly doubles if the grid is isolated into the eight separate grid regions. The study also explores the option of utilising pumped hydropower storage, of which the authors claim there could be more than enough storage in the US. However, the authors also point out that there are often strong objections to pumped hydropower storage, objections that rarely occur with battery storage projects. The paper also contrasts with other studies, in this case suggesting that multiple short-term battery storage solutions can effectively function to perform the same role as some other studies have suggested that long-term battery storage would be required for. That is storage with greater than 100 hours of capacity. This study flatly contradicts that and suggests that four-hour storage can meet all the needs, which is cheaper to implement. Indeed, it actually suggests that storage able to output energy for approximately two hours at a time would be sufficient. This is particularly interesting as it hints at the possibility that battery storage capabilities of grid-connected EVs with bi-directional chargers could perform a significant chunk of the peak demand coverage required, especially in light of other studies that suggest that it is worth charging EVs when there is a solar or wind excess, rather than charging them at night as we have traditionally done. To make a completely clean grid work though, there are some other requirements. The paper's authors assume that all low temperature heating will be achieved using heat pumps, and that all high temperature heating for industry will come from electric furnaces and heaters, rather than using hydrogen combustion for either. That's a move that reduces energy demand, because hydrogen production is broadly pretty inefficient, and ties in with a recent paper from Cornwall Insight examining the use of hydrogen for home heating, that also demonstrates that it would be vastly more expensive and less efficient to implement and operate, rather than transitioning to heat pumps. The end result of this is that a fully clean grid with all the energy needs met through electricity in California would roughly double electricity usage, and in Texas would result in a 200% increase in electricity needs. But thanks to the massive increases in efficiency, overall energy demand across those two states actually drops by about 57%. Those reductions come from moving from natural gas, air and water heaters to electric, combustion to electric vehicles, and there's no need to mine conventional fuels, and as I say, there's a raft of efficiency improvements. There are a whole host of factors that I've not covered here that are included in the paper, and it's well worth a read if you want to understand what they included and how they calculated it. But it really supports the notion that if we want to do it, we can. A cleaner, greener future is there for the taking, we just need to step up and do it. That's it for today, thanks for joining me, and see you next time. If you liked the video, please consider giving it a thumbs up and sharing it with your friends, and if you really liked it, why not leave us a super thanks? It's easy to do and everything you send goes towards helping us make great content. If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to this channel and our other channel, Transport Evolve Take 2, and give the bell a gentle ring to make sure you're told when our next video goes live. And be sure to check out our regular sponsors, including the lovely folks at Unspun and Energy Sage. Links down there. Thanks on behalf of the entire TE crew, go out to everyone who makes TE possible. That includes everyone who supports us on Patreon and YouTube, as well as those of you who just watch the video and share it. If you're a supporter at the charged up level, you'll see your name here on my right. And if you just joined, we're sorry if your name isn't showing, we currently render the list out every week or so, but sometimes our videos are produced a few weeks in advance. Thanks to our self-driving tier supporters, Mike Weeder, Patrick Boyarski, Chris Maxwell, Brian Newton, Michael Goad, Bennett Elder, Andrew Martin, Pedro Muro Pinheiro, Brophy Wolf, Chris and Michael Johnson, Tezza in the Gong, Dan Blair, Peter Dillinger, Gordon C, Stephen O'Donoghue, Kyle Hodgson, Anthony Coates, Raging Fellows, Denny Hyde, Chris Asenta, and Jim Burness. And of course, out of this world thanks to our Starman supporters, Andrew Glenn, Anonymous Freak, JP Fagerback, 
Joe Bresney, John Lyons, Rory Litwin, Kevin Burrowbridge, Laura Reynolds, Marcel Ward, Matthew Drobnak, Paul Conway, Reggie Watts, Will Graylin, and there's that other person. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's Ian. Of course, Ian. How could I forget? Want to be part of that amazing list? You can join Patreon at the link below. You can hit the join button below to support us on YouTube or show us your support through Bitcoin, Kofi, or our cool swag store. And if you're unable to support us financially, just know that watching the video and sharing it makes a real difference to our ad revenue. And it keeps the algorithm <laughs> calm and settled and much less nibbly. Thanks for joining me. And as always, Keep evolving!